Um, I think I'm going to kick off now, everyone. So, uh, welcome to Harvey and Leeds. And a quick introduction to myself. My name is Lewis Holmes. I'm an all data platform consultant with 15 years experience. I've been consulting to many companies, as I mentioned before, including Microsoft, Maximus, Manchester Airport Group, currently the one that's been to the day so a London based data consultancy. And I specialize mainly in the Microsoft based platform, everything in Azure and Power BI and Fabric, I guess now. Um, LinkedIn profiles there, if you want to reach out, I have to have any questions. But um, I'm going to crack on. Yeah. Now, the previous guy used the same slide, and you've had an MVP explain this to you. So I'll, let, I'll kind of let go very quickly over it. What I'm going to focus on today is um, the notebooks elements, pipelines, Lake houses, and how that all sits together within one lake. So, uh, one lake, as we um, found out earlier, is underpinned by its all data lake Gen 2, so it's all storage. And basically, the, the files you save there, the native format it, it wants is a Delta Parquet format. And if things are in Delta Parquet format, you can point your Power BI reports straight at this file. There isn't going to be any data set refreshes or anything like that. You, if you set it up correctly, your Power BI reports can read straight from the data. So I'm going to do an end-to-end -end example of that today. So as I said, this will be an end-to-end -end ingestion, mild transformation, some modeling, and just a proof of concepts about how you can have a Power BI report that's loading data using direct link, and how you can kind of get that refreshed. And uh, to do that, I'm going to be utilizing the new fabric features, uh, lake house, pipelines, notebooks, and then of course, Power BI data sets and, and the Power BI report. Um, I'm going to talk briefly, um, well, yeah, it's still a preview, as we just saw, like it is a bit flaky sometimes. Um, I've run through this a few times, so I'm hoping it's going to be pretty smooth, but it is in preview, so you don't only really have the risk of technological breakdowns. But some organizations don't like you running uh, well, using preview features in production. So you might not be able to just run off and start kind of using this. But it's certainly a good thing to have right now to start kind of using and to get an understanding of the different technologies. So um, I'm just talk briefly about licensing. Now, as far as I'm aware today, you can get fabric in three ways. If you go into app.parbi.com, it may offer you the chance to sign up for a free trial. Your organization has to enable that. If they do, some I've heard stories that organizations are limited to 10 trials. That might vary. But if you have the option for a free trial and you've got it, then great, you can use it. Fabric came out about two months ago. It gave you a 60-day free trial. When I was preparing for this, it offered to extend mine another 60 days. So if you did sign up, two months ago, we can probably go back in and get another six days out of it. If you have Power BI Premium, if you um, get Fabric as part of it, if you enable it, again, your organization might not like the notion of all these things just appearing in Power BI workspaces. But if you do have Power BI Premium, you do get Fabric as part of it. There is no extra cost, with the small exception of all the files you're saving on one link. Um, Microsoft give you a certain amount of storage free. I've not been able to figure out finding the way that says that quantifies that. But when you go with that, we may just charge the prevailing rate for data lake Gen 2 storage in your region. So it shouldn't be. And uh, the final way to get it is you can provision it through the Azure portal and assign it um, against your workspaces. So I'm going to do that now so that you'll be able to actually see the pricing of this. So I have an Azure portal resource group here. And like everything else, you can just go and search for fabric. And you can create a fabric capacity. And it's going to ask me where I want to save it within Azure. And, and the focus isn't really on the Azure platform here. I'm just going to provision something. And um, so we can say lowercase. That's not wrong. Whatever. And then the important bit is the capacity here. So if we change the size of this, it shows you the pricing. And it is expensive. So if you have Power BI Premium on the entry level capacity, which is the P1 SKU, that is equivalent to this one here, the F64 
So if you have Power BI Premium on P1, you get all the capacity units, whatever that means, 64 capacity units in your Power BI Premium 2. You can go off and use all that compute at no extra cost. For those of you who do have Power BI Premium, you'll notice that this number here is much bigger than what that costs, perhaps about 180%. Microsoft's rationale for this is this is something you can scale up and scale down whenever you want. So you can have it on F4, but then overnight wrap up to F32 and scale it up and down. And I think we can even turn it on and off. My understanding is at some point they'll be bringing out fabric uh, product codes that are kind of bought them here, and that'll be in line with the pricing of Fabi Premium. Lewis, is capacity just compute, or is that storage as well? Just computers. So everything in the fabric kind of banner is um, is only um, constrained by the computes. So you're just buying the computes. So if you're doing notebooks, warehouses, lake houses, whatever you're doing, that's all just using computes and nothing else. One lake is using storage. And as I said, you do get some free, but then over that, you will get a bill on your Azure accounts for storage at the Azure Data Lake Gen 2 rates. So, so this part does not include the storage, basically. They have, they have some, but I can't find anywhere that says how much it is. Um, I, 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 I've not incurred any costs yet, and I've been playing around with them. Because this is my money, I'm going to do F2, and, and then, uh, then uh, delete this later. This will uh, go on. Sorry, sorry, just on, on, the, on the costing, on the, on the scale, scaling up and scale down, my, my understanding is that if you scale down from below a premium, you might get Oh, then have to pay for all access. Yes, yeah. so, so my understanding is the benefits of Pavia Premium is that you get to share up in your organization without needing Pavia Pro. Yeah. If I'm wrong. And you only get that benefit if you're scaled up to F64. If you're underneath that, then yes, your users will need to have Pavia Pro to access the things that's when your fabric capacity works. So you can the capacity, can you? So, you essentially turn it off, turn it off, and don't incur any sort. Yes, you can pause it here, yeah. and then, as I say, you can change the size whenever you like. It's it's like the other result products that we programmed down to the newest hour. So here we go. So I'm just going to go into Power BI now and create a new workspace. So when you create a workspace. You can choose whether you want to have the trial subscription or the capacity that I've just provisioned. And here it is. Now, um, the, the trial capacity, I don't know which one of these it equates to, but in my testing, I was trying to run my demo through on F2, and it wasn't very successful. So I think actually, to avoid something like the last talk, I'm going to use the trial capacity. Let's create my workspace. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start off by um, just going to new, show all the lovely new features. Um, I'm not going to concentrate on many of these. What I'm going to concentrate on is lake house, notebooks, and pipelines. So I'm going to create a lake house first, and I'm going to call it lake house. And then that will create a space, a space within OneDrive where you can store your files and tables. At the moment, this is empty, but for uh, directly query to work, you need to have your data registered as a table. Now, you can't just upload an Excel file into the table area. You need to transform it into the Delta, the Delta Parquet format. Um, so what I'm going to do is just upload some sample data and run through a couple of examples. So I've got a nice products table, so I'm just going to upload that. It's the CSV file. That is now uploaded. It's appearing here, and it's just standard product ID, name, category. But we need to register that as a table. And to do that, we need to convert it into the Delta format. So the easiest way to do that is just to do get data as new pipeline. 
the, the pipelines are in Fabric will be familiar to you if you've used Synapse pipelines or Azure Data Factory. They are pretty much the same. And when it loads up, we'll just get a nice wizard that's going to step us through this. Now, because it is built upon Azure Data Factory, you have all the connectors as that does. So you can load data into your lake house from Azure Global, um, SQL databases, Azure, uh, the web, uh, any of these connectors that exist, you can use. The data I've just loaded is in our lake house, so I'll select that as my source. It's a file and it will search the lake house, show my file. And it's pretty clever. It'll realize it's a CSV file, parse it correctly, and that's how it's going to look. Cool. And our destination is the same lake house, but this time we're going to register it as a table. We're going to call it products. And we're going to set it to overwrite. So every time you run this pipeline, it will take that file and that will just, whatever's in the file will become the uh, the, the product table in your lake house. You can append, and then if you need to more complicated stuff, the, the, you, you can do upsets. So now that it's done, I'm not going to run it immediately. <clears throat> I'm just going to have it create it. This is a copy, copy products. And again, very familiar to data factory users, all of this stuff's pretty normal. What I'm going to do is import the mappings because for the relationships to work with, I need to tell you that the product ID is a number. Uh, everything else is a string. I've changed it here to number. Here it still says string. Don't know why, but it does still work. Okay, so now I can save that. You can uh, schedule these to run um, on whatever frequency you would like to, but I'm just going to run it manually now. And you get some, some output, so you can hit this refresh. And just like there's all data factory, you wait a bit while it's queued. And then it will kick in and start actually processing it. <laughs> this generally takes about 10 to 20 seconds. So hopefully not too much longer. We'll just hit refresh until it does it. Um, No, there we go, it's done it. One thing to point out at this point is the new um, monitoring code. This is something that appeared in the Power BI service um, when Fabric was released a couple of months ago, but it wasn't something that you had a choice about. Everyone got this monitoring hub, and it shows you where your data sets are being refreshed. But it also will show you the refresh cycles of your data flow, data flow gen two. <laughs> Input data pipelines, anything that's kind of scheduled jobs will all appear in here now. So it's really nice having kind of one place to see um, to see all your refreshes. You can filter it down by certain things, by names and workspaces. It seems to be a bit of a delay, so it, it, it always comes back and says it's kind of still pending. But, but it is done. So I go back to my workspace. I can go to the lake house. Sorry, that's the. Yeah, this is it. And we now have a product table registered. And that will, that will be now ready to go and report on. We're just going to get some other data in now. As um, the previous talk said, one of the concepts of Fabric is having one copy of your data. So you can reference files in other lake houses. And you can do that in here by just creating the shortcuts. So these options here say new shortcut. I'm going to create a shortcut to a table so I can go here and say new shortcut. And this doesn't even need to be in a fabric, it can just be on a Azure data like Gen Gen 2 account. So if you have a more established data warehouse and gestion operation going on, that is loading data into Parkane in Azure storage, you can just reference it straight into the lake house here. So you don't need to kind of import it, you can just point it as a shortcut straight to it. I have prepared something in. Um, a master data workspace, which personally might be a good idea. You can have an area where you sort out all of your kind of master data, and that can live in a one warehouse 
and that way has some of this examples of what I mentioned. And it's, it's just a data dimension, but the point is that can exist in one place and be made for us many, many times. So if I create that now, you get a slightly different icon there, showing you its uh, shortcuts. And this isn't a real data dimension, it's barely enough to do the reporting, but it's just a proof of concepts. You can reference delta objects in other locations. And it's just got the date and the month number and month name, I think. Yeah. Just enough to get the reporting done. <clears throat> so we have products and we have dates, but we're going to want to see some sales, I think. So I have a file prepared again, so I'm going to upload that. Sales for June. Upload. Now, if you, if you look at this data, again, it's a CSV file. Um, I was going to load an Excel, but anyway, we've got the sales ID, the date of the sale, Product ID, which is here, and the uh, it's a sale date time. So now we have the date, we've got the timestamp as well. Product ID 35 in that case. So product ID 517. Unit price is 35 pounds, and we got one of them. So in this example, um, we're going to have to create some columns to make the modeling work. We're probably going to want a total price that multiplies unit by quantity, and we need to sort out this date field so we just get the dates from it. Strip out the time. There are a few ways we can do this, but I want to show you notebooks, so I'm going to do it from that way. So back to my workspace, and I'm going to create a new notebook. So these notebooks are um, but, um, they're similar to Databricks if you've ever used that, and it uses Python and PySpark to interact with data. So the first thing you can do is re register your lake house. And it's that one. And then everything that's in my lake house is available here. Now I'm going to do a small amount of coding for five minutes. But if I click in my files, we can see sales and we can drag it on into this area. And we can just run this and then it'll take a moment to spin up the cluster. In, um, there's no data factory or databricks, this can take minutes, but it starts at three seconds. It's, it is really fast in fabric, stringing up the clusters. Then it's running this through, and it's showing me all the data there. If I can I zoom out a bit. Sorry. So I, I'm not really here to give you a lesson on PySpark programming, but um, the first thing I'm going to do is, like this slide here is loading the file, and it loads it into a data frame, so that's why it's DF. And a data frame is kind of like a variable where all that data lives temporarily. So the first thing we're going to want to do is say, well, we're not going to load the same file every day, so we can make that a wild card. And then we're going to want to do some extra logic here to add some columns. So um, within Hyperbark, you can just do a dot at the end and carry on doing your thing, but then it'll very quickly get quite long. So I'm just going to do a new line, carry on with that. So we want to create a column that's total price, and that is going to be, I'm going to use this notation, unit price. Times by the quantity. And the good thing about this is you can keep us in run and seeing if it fails. And the error messages within this are quite daunting, frankly, but if you just ignore everything else and go to the bottom line, it's telling me that my function it, it, it's not defined yet. I haven't heard about it. And um, I just need to include a few of the functions I'm going to be using. Um, that one. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just importing it. Like, you, you can import like, the whole thing and say star, but that's probably not great for memory. So, I'm going to be specific and say I'm going to use these functions. So, now we have our Total price column there. And I'm going to be uh, specific and tell it what data type ought that to be. Then run that. And then it should, it should round it as well, I think. There we go. And the other column I want to create is a date column. Now, this uh, sales date time column at the moment is just text. So we, uh, we need to be able to convert that. 
So I am going to steal some code from here. So uh, I'm going to create a Unix timestamp from that column. So if I run this now, and I provided the format so, so it knows how to read the column, the text column. And if I scroll across, we'll see we got a timestamp here. <clears throat> That's nice, but we need to get into a date. So the other function is this from Unix time section. And again, you just give it a format of what you want it to end up like. So it's simple, yeah. Then run that. And now we should have a nice uh, column that just represents the dates. And I've got some sort of bracket. Should be there. Cool. I'm going to scroll, but there we go, it's the dates. And again, I'm just going to cast it as a date. So we've been explicit about the data types. Because I'm a bit short on time, I'm not going to type all this out in front of you. So I'll just uh, put some paste in. <clears throat> but the uh, intention here is that uh, we have our data frame, which this one is called DF. And we are selecting columns from it. We're selecting the sale ID as a number, data ID as a date, product ID as a number, unit price floats. Quantity and total price. So we've added the columns in this stage on line three, and we're just doing kind of a simple select. And the end bit here is writing it into the uh, lake house. So we're telling it to overwrite if it's already there. We want it in the delta format, and it's going to be called sales. So if I run that now, that is uh, something again goes to the bottom. Data ID does not exist. So I call it date, the date here. So we'll do that. <clears throat> and you can see what it's doing inside the uh, Spark engine, but it's a bit beyond me now. <laughs> but um, upon completion, we should have a new table in our lake house, and it's saying 77 <laughs> is complete. I'm just going to rename the notebook. Yeah, I don't know why it does that. It's a missile one. Okay, so now if we go back to our workspace, we have our ingest sales notebook there saved. But more importantly, in the lake house, we now have our sales data. <laughs> Dear. So um, I need to recreate it with the right date format. So I'll just delete it from here. So I call this date. Let's do some dates. OK, so let's do it as date ID. I can't see what's wrong there, so let's go back. It's date meant to be lowercase d at the on the uh, yeah, yeah. casting. Like um, when I was testing it before, it didn't seem to mind which way around it was. Hmm. Well, I can't see it might just be standard, that might just be how it displays it, which is really irritating. But yes. let's um, really do it once more and then I'll carry on and see how they can impact it has. OK, so let's go back to the workspace and the main house. Give us a refresh for good measure. And then our sales is recognized as a date column. We have our other data here. And it's still brought through. Oh, yes, and maybe that's just how it's displaying it here. Yeah, it's the yeah. Same. yeah, it does that. OK, okay so now we have some, um, some, some uh, tables we can create a report of. 
Sorry? It's just supposed to be a song that keeps the date. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't be a date. That's all. <coughs> anyway, let's... <laughs> so on the uh, lineage view, which uh, Microsoft have brought kind of front and centre now, uh, with this button here, we can see all the different objects and how they interact. So this is the way Kels have been working in, creating all my tables, and they should appear maybe in the list there. We have our notebook, our pipeline that's doing the ingestion. We have a SQL endpoint, which I'll talk about briefly later, and a data set. Now, you always get a data set when you create a lake house. It's called a default data set, and it contains all of the tables. So as you can see, date product sales are all in there. Well, you can't create relationships in this. Uh, there's an option here, open data model. You can't do it. You can't create relationships to really edit it. But what you can do is if we go back into the lake house, is we can create a new data set of this lake house. And we do want to have all of these tables. It just take it did take about 30 seconds to a minute when I was doing it before, but here we go. And now we have a data set we can edit. So we can create our relationships product to product, and it works much like it does in Power BI Desktop. It's realized it's the one to many relationship. But we can also drag dates onto dates. Okay. And we can sort out formatting as well here. So if date's going to be on the axis, we can have it shown in this format. And you can create measures. So I'm going to create a new measure against our sales table. And simple measure, total price. And again, we can select that measure and tell it its currency with two decimal places. So I'm going to rename this lake house. So I'm going to call it sales. So now if we could go back to the workspace and look at the lineage view, we will have two data sets completing us our well SQL endpoint, we've got our sales one, which is the one we, we can edit and create measures against. And we have the default data set. Well, I'm going to create a really, really quick simple report of this. Oh, no, it's a good question. What's the point in the default data set? You can't do a lot with it. And I'm sure there is one, but I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> have you tried to get hold of this data set in Tabular Editor successfully? Um, I, I don't think any of that's anywhere near supported yet. Um, no, you, uh, the XML editing of your data sets, I don't think is here yet. So, for the time being, you're going to be doing stuff manually in the Power BI service. The piece inspiration is there, but I've not tested out how robust any of that is. But to very quickly bring on the paint. It's a line chart. And just to show all the slicing and dicing is working, bring into that. So now we have a report that's showing data for June. And I'll just save that as sales. And the, the, the point thing I'm trying to illustrate by having this um, end to end is the uh, direct lake kind of query. So if we go back to the workspace and we look at we look at our sales data set. These tables here, when you click on them under advanced, tell you it's in direct link storage mode. So there is no storage implication of these objects. They're not being saved inside the data set. And therefore, you don't need to refresh the data set. When you're looking at the lineage view, you, you can imagine someone's interacting with the report. The report's going to the data set. That is going to the SQL endpoint. Now, if someone writes really complex DAX, it may revert to writing a SQL query against the endpoint, but the idea is in most cases you won't need to do that. It will go straight to the lake house where those data, those delta parquet files live, query them directly, and return the data to your report. 
or if the data exists elsewhere, like the dates table does, it goes off to the, the other workspaces, the other lake houses, or even external storage accounts, and it will go all the way through this kind of uh, hierarchy, and it will go and find your data wherever it resides in that one place, and then feed that straight back into your reports. Now, then it becomes a question of, okay, you just need to make sure your delta tables are updated and updated in one place, and then you, all of your different data sets and reports can reference them. So if I create a new tab, so at the moment we've got data for June, I can go into the um, lake house again. The lake house. And I've got some data for the first couple of weeks in June, so I'm going to upload that to the file. Uh, that one. So now it exists in here. So you can imagine some external process is populating data into your storage accounts. And then all that needs to happen is the notebook needs to be executed. So if I find the notebook. So the notebooks can be scheduled just like the uh, like the pipelines can be. But I'm just going to run it manually here. In um, Azure Data Factory proper, you can trigger pipelines and therefore you can trigger a notebook off the creation of a file in, in your storage accounts. That doesn't seem to be available. I can't make that work. The event grid kind of integration doesn't seem to be there yet. But that would be a, a cool thing because it imagine this thing firing off as soon as a file lands and then you can come back to your reports and then you get some new data all the way up to the 18th and then if you've been a bit more kind of clever about it what we could do is we can look at our lake house we can load this incrementally so we can delete our data for june and july so you've had a process come along and archive that I just want to upload data for yesterday. And then within the uh, notebook, it's a simple change here to make this append rather than overwrite the data. So now it will just process that one file. So we're just we're wildcarding this. So anything that sales, we've got one file for yesterday. We can run that. And then we can immediately go over here Hit refresh and some data for yesterday will appear there. And there isn't any refreshing of data sets, that's just data going into the Delta table that exists in the storage account. So that was um, the end of my demo, really. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well, do, you, do you get it? Previous versions of the Delta files, or is it a Delta file because it's so are you referring to the versioning that's kind of inherited in Delta? Yeah. Yeah. So because it's in the storage account, you can get to that. Um I don't know how you make your data set refer to previous versions, but certainly in a notebook you could query the Delta table and then ask it. Yeah, so you could write those out somewhere. Yeah. On the endpoint. So this is a serverless endpoint. So in part one way, he's actually Running statements and actually updating the data. Yeah, so there's two things here which are easy to get completed. So this creates the SQL endpoint for the lake house, which, as far as I know, only allows you to query the stuff that's in the lake house. Yes. You can't write store procedures. You can write queries against stuff. You can do in the top hundreds. Well, this doesn't persist any extra data. Whereas if you in within your workspace. Um, discard that within the workspace. It's not what I've seen before. Uh, when you create a new warehouse, I, I, I believe they're different. I feel this is a more fully fledged server seat with the ability to store, have store procedures and views. So yeah. is that a dedicated folder? That's yeah. not known. So um, it's not dedicated folders. It's serverless so you, you get some amount of compute based on what scale of fabric you're on but this warehouse is different and again it's new so i'm a bit unclear but 
is different to this sequel endpoint you get as part of the lake house <coughs> they, they, they are one of the same this this just allows the, um if if it fails to do a direct link query of your reports because you get complexity of the measures then it will fall back and write a sequel command against the endpoint yeah. to get the data okay. but the old one is a different so it's not the same as well yeah, so the, the other one you can provision separately is a warehouse. It right. is almost like the fully fledged server sequel against synapse. Right. Is there any other way to get at the get at the data in the lake? Or is it all just encompassed within within fabric? Yes. So there is a desktop tool as well that will surface your one lake, exactly like OneDrive. Um, and I'm to use Shev's laptop today, mine's not compatible. But on mine, I have this installed. And you can see all of your workspaces and you can directly link the files into your lake house. That might work for one person. But there are a load of endpoints associated with the lake house. So we've got a SQL endpoint, but there was a storage endpoint somewhere. So it's, it has the um, it's the ADFS call and slash RC. It has it has, it has the endpoint for you to connect to it directly. Yeah, I'm observation people. Um concerning the the uh, model and the data sets, you know, at the end of the pipeline there, there's lineage, and it goes to the end. Yeah, we've got, that last one is a model, right? And the one before it is a data set. This is the report. This is the report, this is the report right? Yeah, so and I can open the report and it's... Yeah, I guess the reason why, uh, not just an observation, I think the reason why there's a split in that is because uh, maybe if you have like a forecasting model, you're working on a, on a notebook, um for that data set before the report i think that's where it gets updated and you can push that to the report yeah um, so you can have as many data sets as you would like i believe against your lake house okay. and if your lake house supports lots of tables registered you could have separate kind of views on the data couldn't you all right and this default data set here is something that you always get when you provision a lake house and as i said before yeah. exactly clear its purpose so you can run your um for instance, you have some kind of um, machine learning models on that data set out there. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a data scientist, but maybe you can just apply that. Uh, it's something that I should give you a try. Does Fabric appear as like a service? Like if you turned it up, what would work? What's left working? You know? Oh, yeah. So, like if I did attach the workspace to this capacity, yeah, and then I stopped it, what would happen? Yeah, what would, would anything work in that I, ecosystem? I, I, that's interesting. I don't know because it's, it's like buying Harvey Premium, isn't it? And then yeah. also not having it, would, would everything, presumably, stuff would stop working. Yeah, I saw the prices and I was thinking it'd be nice to save those when I thought, well, will it break everything? Well, it's right. So they, they, they seem to change every time I came in here and, and, and did it. So, like, this is. This, uh, the F64 one is sometimes 8,400. So, so I think the capacity is what's driving that report now. So that, that capacity has to be turned on to be able to serve the data to that report if it's direct lake. Yeah. So everyone in the whole organization is using that one capacity. Everyone, all the workspaces that are registered against that capacity so can you kind of is there any control of um dividing up that capacity to say the users sod them let's give them 10 percent and give the data warehousing experts 90 percent capacity i, I think one of this because you could have a really big data set there's some heavy calculations in there and if some injections going on at the same time like in which takes precedence or is your report slow if someone runs a massive ingestion piece i've not found any uh, the documentation that says that like there is a monitoring hub that's more advanced for the fabric uh, capacities and it shows you which users and which workspaces are using how much of it but i've not seen anything that allows you to restrict anything do you associate the um the fabric capacity here to so the workspace um, yeah so you, you could be just the yeah, yeah so you have you can probably have many workspaces attached to the capacity but then obviously it all comes at a cost isn't it yeah um, what, what is super yeah, let's do what that actually because you run an open excel example so uh, the reason i've highlighted f64 is this is the equivalent of the power premium p1 capacity yeah. so that is pretty powerful and the 
Yeah, sorry, um, I'm, I'm losing track of what your question is. So I'm just saying, what, what, what would you get from what, what sort of capacity would you get there? How would you understand that, turn that into something practical? Yeah, and I, I, I've not been able to kind of get to the point where I'm confident enough to say, if you want to do this task, you should have it, or it's also new, like, and expensive. So I've been using the child capacity and it's also one to let play on a real lot of <laughs> Is the, is, the, the, the is the capacity as well is that that shared across obviously workspace with reports but then all the data operations that are going on in the background so notebooks pipelines data flows uh, yeah i believe so because it's serverless computes and you're paying for the, the that amount of computes yeah. so, so if you were doing everything top data ingestion like through whichever one of those it is um, presuming data factory that's going to take up your capacity as well i believe so A couple of questions. With with that all being with the world security there, you might want your production completely separate from your testing and development area, perhaps even on a different domain. Can one lake talk to another one lake? So one lake is wider than an individual fabric capacity. So um, one bit of an organization can have one fabric capacity, someone else sort of oh, okay. another one. And as long as you grab access, you can get to your Right, okay. Sorry, the second question was um, with the everything that came up with the GUI and with the lineage, it's an awful lot of point and click. If you had hundreds of things to set up, can you do that all by a command line? Not that I'm aware of. No. Um, but the, it does have Git integration, is kind of here. Uh, with it. I believe it works with the Zor DevOps Git repositories. Okay. Then you can save all the code into there, deploy it across environments. Yes. Yeah. I, I've not tested that out. Thank you. So you can obviously provision stuff like this, this capacity programmatically through us or through our templates. And then you can also provision workspaces through the Power BI API. So I'm guessing they're clever enough to realize people who want to assign it to a capacity at the same time. And um, Chef, did you have something? Um, I saw K Kiko. I was going to ask about is that is that a new version of or different version of SQL or is that what? Uh, this is uh, KQL. 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 Is that um Custo or uh, I'm not? Yeah, it's, it's yes. Custo streaming. Um, it's really good. Um, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Just, so I know you don't work for Microsoft, so it's a bit of a general one. With obviously a lot of the Synapse branded products that are already there going into Fabric, do you think they're going to get rid of it? Or is it some run alongside it? Um, I've heard a lot of people are concerned that Synapse will sort of be kind of left to die the court and then about this time they'll learn deprecate it. I don't know any more than the rumours you probably heard. <laughs> Looking at what they're going to charge for Fabric, that probably makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, and just say for me, one of the good things about Fabric is you get access to all this stuff within the Power Platform. What used to be in Azure is now yeah. just in Power BI. So I've worked on organizations where I asked them for a simple database, just in there, so many forms to pull out. Whereas now, it's all in Power BI, I can just press the button and then run up with it. But I'm sure some data security people probably were a bit concerned about all of this, but but it is, it, 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 it's more immediate to the end user now. There's less hoops to jump to. So that's, that's a good, good point. The moment you've got a lot of segregation because you've got data engineers working on setting apps off and tree and mm. Power BI developers working on Power BI. If all this comes together, how do you how do you can you segregate those those workloads so that you haven't got people just piling in to all this data that's sat in the lake? Well they, they, they seem to release this first and then worry about that later. <laughs> I think is the approach. <laughs> One of the problems with this is that we're going to have general calls that are today until the end of the year. Yeah, and I was here here in November, so yeah. Well, yeah, it can easily be delayed, you can see. And then there are big features missing, like you can't do role level security on your directly models, and all the that's meant to be handled by Perl, but all this one security stuff with the Perl new features will break them in, but all that's kind of that's Perl new to. Yeah, but didn't include it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Lewis, what are the monitoring options on the P 
PBUI leads tab, the Microsoft Azure. If you go down on the left hand, oh, you've got alerts. No monitoring. But I do, there is a separate monitoring portal, in, and uh, I've not been to it, but I've seen screenshots, screenshots of it. So, similar when you have Power BI Premium, you've got an admin portal and you can see what's going on. You can do that on fabric capacities. Yeah. 